Okay. As we follow somebody, it should be Jesus that we are disciples of, but some people are disciples of the perfect family or financial independence, or it can even be a certain brand of theology. You can follow that. And remember John 5, 39, 40, you know, you study scripture thoroughly, but you're not willing to meet Jesus through scripture. So anyway, um, just a reminder that uh, we are making disciples of Jesus. We're becoming disciples of Jesus and pointing others to him, and that's the whole point. So now that we have a mic, let me open in prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that there's life behind your word, and this whole thing isn't some weird religion that binds us up, and, and we approach every day with, you know, 600 things that we can't do. It's, it's not that at all. It's, it's life-giving, and um, for those out there here and out there, we just pray that we would continue to understand that the best version of ourselves lies in walking in intimacy with you. And so may you just open our hearts through your word here today, and may we respond to your unconditional love uh, with joy and openness. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I already mentioned that our, our world is a dumpster fire, and you're in it. Right? Whether or not your world is a dumpster fire at this moment or not, it, it will be right sometime in the future. That's just the way life works. And so the question is, where do you look for stability and rest when your life is a dumpster fire? Is it possible? Or do you just have to like tread water and hope until that season of life is over and then enjoy stability and rest? And that's kind of where we're going today. But as always, I do like to review, partly so I can remember what I'm talking about. So indulge me. So we have um, the book of Ruth. This is the whole Bible. Sin starts in Genesis 3, and the whole Bible is about redemption all the way to Revelation, and you are here way down the road. We are right here in the book of Ruth, okay? So it's left of the cross. Jesus hasn't been born yet, and it takes place during the time of Judges, right? And so if you look at your Bible, you have the books of the law. You have the books of history. Now remember, by the time you get to the book of Esther, all the other books have already happened chronologically. So the book of Esther is chronologically the end of the Old Testament. So all the books of poetry, all the prophets, they all happen in the middle of this history stuff. That's just, I think, interesting. But the very first verse of Ruth is packed with information and assumptions and opinions. So here we go. In the days when the judges ruled, that's your first major clue, and that brings with it a whole mindset of those cycles of sin and redemption. Uh, there was a famine. That's another big clue. Okay, theologically, if you're a Jew, you know famines are here because we have disobeyed. Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, super clear. If you worship the gods of the lands, you think fertility comes from them, God shuts off the rain to show you, us, Israel, everybody, that life comes from him. There, uh, a man, okay, not a family, but a man of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem means house of bread. You get the irony? There's famine in the house of bread. Something's wrong here. Uh, he went to sojourn in the country of Moab. That's just a horrible idea. Moab, 2 Kings 3, that's the place where the king sacrifices his own son. What, what, are, you, what are you doing there looking for life? Anyway, so the man, he... He and his wife and two sons. I'm reading that, understanding that it was a Limelech's decision to drag Naomi out of Israel, drop her off in Moab. He promptly dies, leaving her alone, and we have the rest of the story. Anyway, and there we go with that. So he, um, these are the cycles, the redemption cycles of Judges. Sin, foreign oppression, regret. And remember, that's technically really not repentance. Because if you read Judges, they're never really, like, repenting. There, there's no remorse. There's no, we're sorry. It's just like, I'm tired of being oppressed. And then God, surprisingly to me, delivers them, and they have peace, and then they forget about everything and do it seven times over and over. But here's a verse that just reminds us that, that uh, famine in the Old Testament was theological. The heavens over your head shall be bronze. The earth under you shall be iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder. From heaven, dust shall come down until you are destroyed. That's in the context of if you continue to disobey. So in the, the, the part of, uh, of that is disobedience. All right? So um, where is Moab? It says he went off to Moab. Um, same thing. Too many words. Here's Moab. 
where does the story take place? This is Bethlehem, house of bread. This is Moab. And so they, they journey over across the Jordan River and down. But basically, if there's a famine in Israel, there's a famine in Moab. I mean, because it's like, it's like there's not a famine in Council Bluffs and, and not one in West Omaha. You get what I'm saying? Okay, so that's where it is. Here's a field. This is a field from, um, of Bethlehem. So remember, fields in those days were small, maybe one or two acres, because as, the, as you have kids, whatever field you have is now divided up with what kids, whatever kids they have, that little field is divided up, and so everything gets smaller, smaller, smaller. So not a lot of land. Here's the characters of the story, and a lot of funny names. No one calls their, their son Elimelech these days, so I want to get back and show you the characters and what happens. So while they're in Israel... Elimelech marries Naomi. They have two sons, and um, then they go over here to Moab, and these two sons marry Ruth and Orpah. These two women are Moabite women. Um, that's a question mark, you know, given Deuteronomy 7, don't, you know, you should just marry Israelites. Well, then while they're in Moab, the men die, and I go back to verse 1, a man, he took his family to Moab. And so the consequence of the covenant consequences, they die, leaving Ruth and Naomi, or Orpah split. So these two women now are left, and then they go back to Israel. This is just a, a picture of Moab. There are some um, fertile lands in Moab. Okay, at the end of chapter one, we have um, a bitter woman who used to be pleasant. We have a widowed woman who used to be married. We have one daughter-in-law, no sons, defenseless. She used to have protection, no support. So uh, things are kind of going downhill in a big hurry, all right? But this, this is um, a story of Ruth and Boaz. It's not just a love story. I mean, if you pick up some commentaries and stuff, it, it, it kind of presents it. That's the typical approach. It's a love story, Boaz and Ruth. No, true. But it's so much deeper than that, okay? It's so much in their culture. They're not seeing a love story. They're seeing covenant faithfulness and covenant consequences. That's, remember, in the days when Judges ruled, right? You've got Joshua, Judges, Ruth. So this is all set in that context, all right? So that's where we're going here. It's not just a love story. It's, it's about God's loving kindness and God's faithfulness. And your experience of whatever blessings you may experience is going to come as a result of your relationship to the covenant. You follow the covenant, you'll be blessed. You, you reject the covenant, you're going to experience all kinds of stuff that Naomi experienced. Death, destruction, heartache. All right? So um, that leads us to what we're talking about today. You are here. That's the dumpster fire, right? So where do you look for rest and security when the world's flying apart? So let's go to verse 1, Ruth 3, verse 1. It is possible to find hope in the midst of our trials. Naomi and her mother-in-law said, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you. Now this is interesting. First off, the phrase mother-in-law, the, I did a study on that. The root word in Arabic and Egyptian has to do with a legal protector. So it seems that Ruth is sort of standing up, I want to do what I can to protect you. But the phrase, look at this, should I not seek rest for us? Is that what it says? No, it says, should I not seek rest for you? Okay, interesting. Um, and rest, I've argued, rest is the main point of the book. So I'm going to go back to this chiastic structure. We're not going to dig into all these little points, but... The main point, the center of this style of writing, which was very common in the Hebrew mindset, the center of it was usually the main point. All I'm saying is the center of the whole book of Ruth, this is the whole book of Ruth, is about rest. Rest comes from God's loving kindness, from returning from Moab to the house of bread, and from following and to following God in faithfulness. So this is where they're going to find rest. All right? So again, rest, let this sink in. Rest let me just explain rest. Rest means security and stability. It doesn't mean take a nap, okay? It doesn't mean financial independence to them. To them, rest means you have a husband, you have sons, you have a future, you're stable, you're secure. This is their mindset of rest, okay? And so um, rest is going to come from following the covenant, following God in his way, in his land. 
All right, so um, we've already had a couple verses that mention rest. Uh, 1 9, Naomi says to Ruth and Orpah, just go back to Moab. May you find rest in Moab. Well, good luck with that, but that's what she says. And then you have Naomi uh, seeking to provide um, rest, even though she herself says, I'm empty. So she has been um, converted into that bitter woman because of covenant consequences and struggling in, in Moab. So um, as, this word rest is much deeper and thicker for, the, for these, these people. Rest, that stability, um, think, about, think about the Sabbath rest, okay? You have, you have the Egyptian bondage. After they're delivered out of Egypt, the Lord introduces the Sabbath rest, now, think about that. If you've been slaves for 400 years, you have no rest. You have to work every single day. Now you've been delivered from that context, and you do not have to work every day. You're not defined by your work. You have freedom. All right? And so this is a brand new concept for these people, that, that rest is now possible, actually prescribed. It's what God wants you to do to... Um, think and meditate on him. The Sabbath is not just to rest up and so you can work hard again. It's to focus our minds on who God is, what he's done for us. Well, they, they, they're, they're delivered from Exodus. They're going to the promised land. The promised land is the setting, the context for the story of rest. They're supposed to go into the promised land and Joshua to the degree that they are obedient. They have victory. Judges, to the degree that they disobey, they have defeat. That's what those two books are about, right? Victory through obedience, defeat through disobedience. And so we see that moving on. And during that time and a bunch of the kings, Israel is oppressed and subjugated by four nations as part of the covenant consequences, okay? It's not surprising. You, 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 you spit in God's face, he's going to stir up Assyria, and Assyria is going to come and mess with you as a reminder to turn back to him. So during all these centuries, all this oppression by Assyria, Babylon, and Persia, and Greece, and Rome, um, Israel starts to develop this culture of loss, this culture of of, of subjugation, and they start to think of the coming Messiah in terms of a military figure, right, to fix it all. So that's where that comes from. Then we fast forward to the New Testament, and um, Jesus is announcing he's the one that can provide rest, except he doesn't look like what everybody thinks he should look like. They're expecting a military guy, you know, Black Hawk helicopters and night vision stuff, right, <laughs> blow up Rome, but this, this rabbi comes who's, who's sort of, a, I mean, in the culture, he's like a reject rabbi. He doesn't, he doesn't fit the mold, and so people are struggling to see um, who he is, but that's what Mark's gospel is all about. A new way has been introduced to God, and, and here we are talking about rest. In Matthew, classic verse about rest. Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, that's his yoke of discipleship, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, not just your bodies, but your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And the, the, the Pharisees had loaded up all kinds of impossible things for these people, and so um, Jesus is, is um, saying that. All right. That's a blank slide. Um, is not, verse 2, let's go to verse 2. Is not Boaz our relative, that's significant, is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do uh, some more slides here. But um, as soon as Boaz shows up in the story, there's, there's a little bit of hope. There's a little bit of Naomi wondering, what does that mean? Um, Naomi knows her family tree. She knows Boaz is, he, she, she has already called him a redeemer, all right? So she already, she already knows there's a possible source of joy, but um, she's still coming from a bankrupt, broken, empty, bitter platform, all right? It's interesting that, that even though Naomi has called Boaz back in 220, chapter 2, verse 20, Naomi said to Ruth, the man is a close relative of ours. He's one of our redeemers. But, but the very next verse, even when Naomi is telling Ruth what to do, listen to this. Naomi tells Ruth, stay close to Boaz. 
And she does not say, because he's a redeemer. We might have a hope and future in him. She says, stay close to Boaz because, quote, you might be assaulted in another field. It's, it's like, okay, it's a little less grandiose. It's a little less theologically deep. It's just like, you're probably not going to get molested in his field, so keep that up. Anyway, so my point is Naomi is, is slowly moving towards hope, and isn't that something we can relate to? Right? If we're despairing and broken and empty and bitter, you don't just flip a switch and all of a sudden, that's great. It's just this slow, you dare to look for hope. As you think you see hope, you're scared. We're scared. Like, I don't want to hope again. I'll just be shattered and broken, and it'll just be worse. So sometimes we're very reluctant to, to acknowledge there might be hope. And I think that's Naomi's situation. She's lost her husband. She's lost her sons. She says, God is against me. Everything's against me. She even tells her daughter-in-laws four times, don't bother coming to Israel. There's nothing for you there. God hates me. He's against me. Just go marry some Moab Moab guy, and, and maybe you'll find more blessing than I found. And so that's where she's coming from. But as soon as this Boaz, the Redeemer, you know, we, we see this, this faint hope. She's wondering if that's going to be possible. Well, he's winnowing at the threshing floor. And so we showed you these a couple weeks ago. These are sheaves of wheat. They go out with a, a sickle and cut the, uh, the wheat, stack it up. Then they haul it to a threshing floor here. Um, and they would have oxen drive around with this kind of sled that would rip it up and smash it. And then they pile it up and they throw it up with these um, fork, pitchforks, and the wind usually would do this in the evening. The gentle wind would blow away all the chaff, and the heavy grain would, would settle down, and that's, that's what they're doing. So this is the threshing floor. Now, the threshing floor was a public place, all right? It was a time of harvest, so you have men and women, sometimes families would be there, and uh, kings would gather occasionally at the threshing floor to make announcements. Uh, prostitutes would hang out at the threshing floor because that was a place of business for them, the time of fertility. It was just a place that it, it, there's no privacy there, and sometimes uh, sketchy things happen there. Keep that in mind, right? Verse 3, wash, Naomi says to Ruth, wash, therefore, anoint yourself, put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. Now, this is much more than just, you know, be clean, smell nice, so you're attractive. She is mourning the death of her husband, and in that culture, when you wash and put on perfume and new clothes, you are officially done with the mourning period, and you can, you're can you free to remarry. So that, that's rich with symbolism, and Boaz is not going to miss that point, right? So, verse 4, the instructions continue. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what to do. Okay, just imagine you're Ruth. You grow up in Moab, you grow up worshiping uh, Molech, and, um, and you, you connect to this, this, this sad family, this bitter woman, Naomi, and she, you go with her. I was going to say she hauls you back, but you, you know, Ruth went willingly back to this foreign country of Israel, and now you're there, they've got a different God, they've got different customs, and, and the, the only connection you have to that culture says, here's the plan. Okay, you're going to sneak down there at night and um, uncover this guy's feet, and he'll have something to say. I, I just can't imagine, Ruth is like, this is, this is plan A? I mean... What, what is she supposed to do? But she says in verse 5, all that you say I will do. So she, she is accepting the culture, trusting Naomi, and um, it's kind of fascinating. So it, it, uncovering his feet is basically so he'll wake up, right? It's just like, hey, it's cold. What's going on? And then we'll, we'll go on here. Um, but the, the thing that I'm interested in, when Naomi says he will tell you what to do, how does Naomi know what he's going to say? What is, it, what is Naomi assuming that Boaz is going to say, and how does Naomi know that he's going to say what she thinks he's going to say? Fair question. Naomi has already seen evidence that Boaz understands the covenant. He understands the covenant provision of gleaning for poor people, and he is allowed, right? He has allowed Ruth to glean. Remember that phrase Ruth said, I'm going to go out and glean, and, and I'm just going to glean wherever I find favor in the eyes of somebody now, Boaz is like the only guy that's not going to molest her, and she happened upon his field, 
and he happens to be a relative. Okay, you see God's providence behind all this. So uh, the point is this. Boaz knows about the covenant, and he's acting on the covenant with gleaning and everything else. So Naomi is probably thinking, okay, if this guy is selfless enough to lose money to poor foreigners through the provision of gleaning, there's a chance that he might have the character also to act as a redeemer, and there's this little hope, okay? So he, she's probably assuming and hoping that he would initiate something along those lines of marriage. All right, so verse 5. So she goes down to the threshing floor and did as her mother-in-law commanded her. Verse 7. When Boaz had eaten and drunk, his heart was merry. He went down to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Okay, now wh why? why is the guy sleeping on a pile of grain? Remember that? There were three threats to harvest, right? You have drought, you have theft, and you have locusts. Here the threat could be theft. And so he's guarding it. He would sleep by it until he can load it up in bags and carts and distribute it. So he's sleeping there to protect it. But he's, he's, he's lying down at the heap of grain. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Okay, that word softly is the same word when David in, in uh, Samuel, um, David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Okay, if you're doing something like that, it's super quiet, okay? You are very, very quiet. And Ruth, I mean, she, all these other people on the threshing floor, she doesn't want to wake, step on them and wake them up, so she comes in super quietly, uncovers his feet, and then just lays down and waits. Like, that had to be a long couple hours, right? How long do I wait? What if, he did, what if he's a sound sleeper? What if the sun comes up? What? She just waits. Have you ever been awake in the middle of the night, and the hours just drag by. Yeah. Um, so that's her situation, okay? And so, and then she lays down and she waits. And at midnight, the man was startled, turned over, and behold, it literally says, look, behold, a woman. He's like, well, who are you? What are you doing here? He says, who are you? She said, I am Ruth, your servant. And then she adds a little script that Naomi did not tell her which is fine, but this is what she says. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Boom! She just throws down the trump card. Spread your wings over me. You're a redeemer. And Naomi said nothing about that. Naomi was hoping that maybe Ruth and Naomi talked about that. Like, I think he's going to say that. She just, she just blurts that out. And that's, that's totally appropriate and fine. Um, but spread your wings over your servant. Basically, she's, she, she's uncovering his legs, saying, I want to be covered by the provision of marriage. Now, include me in the covering that you, that you have. It's like ancient Near Eastern dating. We don't, you know, it's kind of different today, right? But anyway, um, I want to be part of the covering that you provide, and she says you're a redeemer. It's interesting to me that it's not Naomi, the Israelite, that understands the covenant and the, the Israelite culture about this covering thing. It's Ruth the Moabite. She's the one that, that figures it out and, and presses into the, 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 the covenant code, or the, the legal code of, of um, the Redeemer. So here's basically what's going on. Have you ever heard of Leverite marriage? It's not Levite marriage. Leverite marriage has nothing to do with the Levites. Levir is a, is a Latin word for brother-in-law, and here's how it worked. In the Old Testament, you got two, two guys, like these two guys, um, and they don't have kids. One husband dies. It's the, other, the, the nearest relative, unmarried relative, would go and have children through that widow, and that, those children, at least the first one for sure, would bear the name of the dead brother so that his line doesn't just disappear. And after the guy does that, then, then he can devote his time to his wife and his family. But there's, it's a selfless act because you're taking time and energy and a lot of your money to, to get this farm going for someone else that you're going to see none of the profits to or from. Okay, So that's just how they did that in this culture. It's called uh, Leverite marriage. And the purpose was that no line, no family line, would just disappear in that culture. All right, And so... A kinsman redeemer, that's what we're talking about. So here's, here's the kinsman redeemer, the responsibilities. Um, if, 
if you're single and your brother was married with no kids and he dies, your responsibility would be to redeem or buy back any land that was sold, avenge any shed blood if, if he was murdered, marry the deceased brother's wife, buy back a family member been sold as a slave, and basically look after him. That's, that's, a, that's a tall list. Now remember during the days of Judges when anarchy's ruling? We don't see this, right? Because this takes character and selflessness. Qualifications. He must be a blood relative. Interesting. He must have enough money to buy the inheritance and willing to spend it. That comes up later in chapter 4. He must be willing to marry the wife and raise children for the deceased name. So these are just basically what's, what's swirling about that culture. Now, Boaz is not the brother. Did you know that? There's no legal obligation for Boaz to step into this. Because there is another guy that's closer, and so he's kind of stepping back, understanding, well, this, there's other people, there's other opportunities, and I'm, I'm old. That comes up later. But Boaz is still a blood relative. Naomi says he's from the clan of Elimelech. He has enough resources, and he seems to be willing to spend them, and so that's why we're here. But can I just take a parenthetical journey here and talk about Jesus as our kinsman redeemer? Is Jesus a blood relative of God? Yeah. It, does Jesus have enough resources to redeem us from sin? Yeah, he does. No one else has resources like that. It, is Jesus willing to spend his resources to give us forgiveness of our sins? Yes, he is. Is he willing to marry the group of believers called the church? Yes, he is. Isn't that great? And so through simple belief in who Jesus says he is, the Son of God, forgiveness of sins can come, and we're part of a community called the church, and he's coming back for his church. That's what is all figured there, okay? So, Ruth basically asks, marry me. She, she's, it's not inappropriate, but she's pretty aggressive. She's like, okay, covenant stipulations. You have the opportunity, Boaz, to really step up here and be a good man. It's kind of like that, right? And you're like, how do, you, how do you shrink down from that as a man? You're like, yes, I will do that. So not inappropriate. She carried out all that Naomi had said and a bit more, and that's all right. So, um, but it's still awkward. You have this, this servant asking the landowner. You have a Moabite asking a Jew. You have a poor woman asking a rich man for these, for these favors. And so uh, you can see God's hand here. Let's go on here. Verse 10. Um, and he says, blessed by the Lord are you. You've made this last kindness greater than the first. You've not gone after younger men. So he apparently is old. He apparently has just stepped out of line like, I'm old. She won't want me. There's other younger, other, uh, younger men. But she's attracted to Boaz because of his character, not just because of his looks, all right, or his money. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you have asked for my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman, all right? Um, he has been called a worthy man. He calls her a worthy woman. In fact, this phrase, worthy woman, shows up in Proverbs 31. You know, guys know Proverbs 31. Uh, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. An excellent wife who can find. She's more precious than jewels. So this excellent wife is the same phrase here as a worthy woman. And so, um, and Boaz has been called a worthy man. They're both, it's like a great couple, right? So verse 12. This is where, if this is a movie, this is where you get kind of agitated, you get kind of nervous. You might even start to complain. Now, it's true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. And you're like, no, what? another guy? What? In fact, it reminds me of this. See if you can guess this movie. I'm going to kind of just read. Well, the first thing is going to give it away. But So this woman, a queen, was introduced to the king, and her name was Buttercup, and the king's name was Humperdinck. And so as grandpa's reading the story, he says, Buttercup is going to be the queen for Humperdinck. And the kid's like, Grandpa, you read that wrong. Buttercup doesn't marry Humperdinck. She marries Wesley. I'm just sure of it. After all Wesley did, it just wouldn't be fair. Well, who says life is fair? Where's that written? Life isn't fair. I'm telling you, Grandpa, you're messing up the story. Now get it right. So that reminds me of this because we're going through the story of Ruth, and it's just wonderful. And then you get to this verse, and you're like, another guy? No, there's no other guy here. That's not going to work out. So anyway, I just think that's fun. 
So verse 13, he, go, he continues, remain here tonight, Boaz says, in the morning, if he will redeem you, that's his business, and that's fine. But if he's not willing to, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. All right, so um, we see Boaz not manipulating. He's following the, the covenant rules, following the cultural rules. In verse 14, she lay at his feet until morning. And then look what he says. Let, let it not be known that the woman came to the floor. So he, he understands it could look sketchy. She comes at night and, and, and all this because of what can go on there. So he tells his workers. Every, his workers know about it. He's like, hey, d- you know, no hanky-panky. Just tell, don't, don't tell anybody that she came. Honoring her integrity, protecting his integrity. Um, and so that's what's going on there. So then in verse 15 through 17, he loads her up with about 50 pounds more of grain. And, um, and she comes home, and he says, you must not go home empty-handed. And so her days of being hungry are over. Her days of being abused as a foreigner are over. Her days of being intimidated as a non-Israelite are over. He is praising her, protecting her, and providing for her. So it's a great story. Um, I love the fact that Ruth is, is seen as patient, she waited to glean until all the gleaners had gone. Boaz is patient. He's like, this other guy's first. We'll just see what happens. They have to come back next week. Who gets the girl, right? Um, you can just read it and find out, but we'll talk about that. But it's interesting that Ruth doesn't find rest, stability, and security through manipulation. She doesn't demand her rights. She doesn't, like, press forward and go, I do this, I do this, I can do this, and that kind of is our culture, right? I can do this, and um, she doesn't chase younger men. She finds rest, stability, and security through faithfulness to the covenant that's not even hers by a Moabite. She comes in, right? And, but she finds blessing by obeying God and his covenant. There's a big lesson for Israel. Whoever follows me and adheres to my covenant will find blessing, right? And so she's faithful to the covenant, and the the big picture here is whoever is faithful to the covenant will experience blessing. That's what's going on in this book, in this story, all right? Um, So knowledge of the covenant leads to following the covenant leads to success, all right? So whatever your dumpster fire Whatever you're in the middle of, can you find rest, stability, and security in the middle of that? And that is, I've talked about this before, we, we so often we're in the middle of a difficult situation, and we want that to be over, and we treat it as though it's an anomaly, and it's something to get through and close it off, and we rarely have the maturity, wisdom, or ability to just rest in the middle of the dumpster fire. And say, Lord, would you give me rest, stability, and security through your faithfulness and your kindness right here in the middle of this mess? And that is possible. If you do that, you are going to have a peace that surpasses understanding, and you're going to have people going, wait, what? What's your story? Because that, that's different, okay? And that's an opportunity to share uh, the forgiveness and the freedom we have in, in Jesus. So... Do you have spiritual security? Maybe people chase economic security, they chase relational security, they chase job security, none of those things we can control really. But spiritual security comes through simple belief in who Jesus is, who he says he is, and spiritual security through Jesus is really the foundation for all the other securities. Because once you have Jesus and you understand, no matter what happens to this dumpster file world or life, I am secure eternally in him. Now that gives me then economic stability, because I understand that economically, that doesn't really define me completely. I mean, I have to have money to buy bread, but I'm, I'm not all wrapped around the axle about the, all the ups and downs. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and spiritual stability is a platform for relational stability. I don't have to win every argument to be the guy or whatever the thing is, right? You, 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 are, you are free to interact, love, and forgive, and be gracious. So I, I think there's a lot of practical lessons here. But zoom out. In the days when the judges ruled, to the degree that they followed the covenant, they had success. When they did not follow the covenant, they had death and defeat. And we see that in 
the man that took his family to Moab, death and disaster. When, they, when Naomi starts to follow the covenant, she comes back, sees a crack of hope, slow to believe it, but Boaz, who is, is he's basically personifying the goodness and kindness of God, right? And he is walking faithfully to the covenant, and the lesson there is when we honor him and his ways, there's blessings. So, where does hope lie? This is, this is not working. Okay, and we're moving through some songs that I'm not going to sing to you. So I think there's a, there's a picture, should be a picture of a, a snapshot of a screen. Uh, or maybe not, that's okay. Anyway, so um, if your world is a dumpster fire, and it certainly has been the past two years, right? And it's probably going to be the next two years, I'm just saying. What are you going to do? Are you just going to wait? Are just going to put your life on pause until like it's all over and things get back to normal? Newsflash, Sparky, ain't going back to normal. All right? So anyway, that's what's going on there. How we go about finding rest and security. I think we have final questions. Nathan, do you have a, a screen with some final questions? You can, nope. Okay, so we have some final questions. And those final questions are these. Usually we think about these as we close. How do you go about securing rest and stability? Are you finding rest and stability in the kindness of God? Can you think of anybody that personifies the kindness of God in your life? And I know there's people right here today. Some of you are just crazy out there with kindness. And it's, it's just it's convicting to me. I'm like, wow, that's great, all right? Are you personifying kindness to anybody else like Boaz did to Ruth? Those are good questions. And we're going to close off here thinking about these things. Uh, Lord, thank you for your grace and your kindness. Thank you for the ability we have to walk with you. Your burden is light. In you we find rest. You are the perfect sacrifice, and after your sacrifice, we don't have to keep repeating sacrifices. You sat down. It's over. You're satisfied with your son's sacrifice, and through belief in him, we're good to go with you. And may that just sink in deeply and and create this spiritual stability, and may we find rest and significance and stability in the middle of whatever weird season we're in, And so we just invite you into our lives, our messy lives, our less than perfect lives, our broken lives, sometimes with tears. We we just ask you to meet us in the middle of that and uh, show us your kindness as Boaz showed your kindness to Ruth and Naomi. Amen.